welcome to Codex, a history of video games. I am Mike Coletta. And I am Tyler Osby. And today we're going through the game timeline of the Nintendo GameCube system, and I'm really excited. Tyler, take it away. Yeah, so what we're going to do here basically is go kind of year by year of uh, the GameCube. Uh, we did this for the Xbox also, and just sort of, we picked out some titles that we thought were standout titles that are like fun to talk about that we maybe have personal stories about or, or whatever, um, or we think were influential to the platform or gaming in general. So This kind of took over our top 10 games thing. Yeah. So I think this is better to just go through the whole timeline and be like, because you know what? Let's not get all wrapped up in capitalism, all right? Let's mm-hmm. just see it, the system for what it is in its whole game library. Right. And there are games that are like important or cool that maybe don't crack the top 10 and they're still worth talking about. So we want to talk yeah. about them here. Here we go. Tyler, you got to start it off. I didn't yeah. own a GameCube, full disclosure. So I've only played my friend's GameCube. So I got my GameCube a few years into its life. Uh, I'll actually, I'll talk about that when we get to the point in this timeline where I got my GameCube. But um the GameCube launched on November 15th, November 18th in North America. It launched on November 18th, 2001, um, and it launched with a few different games, um, the top of which I'm going to have to say was Luigi's Mansion. That was probably the standout launch title um, because it was the first Nintendo console to launch without like a mainline Super Mario game. The NES had Super Mario Brothers when it launched uh, North America wide. Um the Super Nintendo had Super Mario World, the Nintendo 64 had Super Mario 64, but the GameCube didn't get anything, didn't get their uh, their Mario game until a year or two later. So, Luigi's Mansion, you play as Mario's brother Luigi, and you go inside of like a haunted mansion, and you have this backpack, you're, you're, going, you're trying to save oh, yeah. Mario, he's been like... <laughs> trapped or something in Luigi's in this mansion and so you have this backpack that's like a vacuum cleaner that vacuums up ghosts and you're the the idea is that you're going to go around all the rooms and vacuum up all the ghosts to beat all the bosses and save Mario um I didn't play too much of this game I've kind of seen a lot of it it did get remade for the 3DS uh like a year or two ago um, oh really so, I should play yeah. it for that because I always I played the game in the Dave and Buster's arcade that's where I played oh, it oh yeah that's a different. That's a different game. That's more of like a shooter kind of thing. I think. Ooh, really. Within I still got to beat this arcade. I, I talk about all these Game Boy or Game uh, Nintendo 3DS games, and I still haven't beaten Pokemon because I only play it while traveling. That's my rule. Yeah. I'm still working way, on Let's Go. Oh yeah, it's also that is a deceptively long game. Mm-hmm. Pokemon Red and Blue was yep. so or Yellow, I guess, is one that's technically the port, but still. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's Luigi's Mansion. One of the cool things I do think about this game is in like your sort of heads up display or like your mini map is on, uh, in the like bottom right corner or bottom left corner. It says it's a, it looks like a Game Boy Color because Game Boy Color was still fairly, well, no, I guess this was right about when the Game Boy Advance had would become, had come out right after Game Boy Advance. But you had this little thing called a Game Boy Horror and it looked like a Game Boy Color and that was like your mini map. And the, oh, wow. all of your gear was given to you by Professor E. Gad. That's pretty, pretty <laughs> funny. Um, Do you love that? Yeah. So that's Luigi's Mansion. Uh, second game on the list of launch titles that I think is good to talk about is Super Monkey Ball. Did you ever play Super Monkey Ball? I never did. I um, always wished I did. So in Super Monkey Ball, you are a monkey inside of a ball that rolls <laughs> around. And nice. as, a, as a player, you control the, the playing field. Basically, you're tilting it around uh, just with your joystick. You're tilting it around and you're trying to get the monkey to not roll off the edge and try to get it to the end through all the obstacles. And it gets really, really difficult. Um, but it was like, it was a Sega game, which, so I, the reason I thought it was cool when it first came out was because it was a Sega game that was not on a Sega console. Um, oh yeah. This was, this really was cool. like right after they decided they were going third party. Ah. Um, and they weren't going to make any more Dreamcasts. They were still making Dreamcasts at this point, but they had already announced kind of the end of the Dreamcasts and stuff like that. Like, or they were still making Dreamcast parts. games. We got to make one more run, and then we're done of it. Yeah. So this was the kind of game that would have been on the Dreamcast. Like It was like sort of weird and quirky and like like just different from everything else. Um, but it was really fun, and it would get a sequel. It would get uh, released on a couple different consoles. Um, there's a phone version of it that uses like the accelerometer, which is pretty neat, and like a really use- neat way to use that kind of technology. So anyway, that one's cool to check out. Um, we can't talk about this generation of consoles without talking about Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3. 
Oh yeah, man. Which was a launch that, title. That is the best. I I love. Can I just mention my favorite level real quick? Yes. Cruise ship. Oh yeah, that's a great. The level. cruise ship is such a great level. So yeah. cool. Such a cool design idea. Mm-hmm. Real yeah, into so it. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, we've talked about it a bunch before. It wasn't really any different on the GameCube, but it did run super smoothly, and it was just a great game. And they had that revert thing, right? Where you yeah. could ride on two wheels to keep them combos going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Tony Hawk 3, they didn't get 2X like the Xbox did, uh, but it got Tony Hawk 3. Um, it also got another multi-platform game is SSX Tricky. We've talked about before, but... It was that part of the reason why that game was kind of so big was because it was sort of it wasn't a PS2 launch title, but it was an Xbox launch title or close to it. And it was a GameCube launch title. And so it was like sort of was across the all three platforms. So everybody played SSX Tricky. Oh, it's tricky. Yeah, I never played that. I played that game, I think, on my friend's GameCube, though. It was fun. Yeah, it's great. It's not as good as three. SSX Tricky. Yeah, not as good as three. Yep. All right. I don't know. Again, like there's a lot of games. You might have to be taking the lead on this one the whole time because yeah. I only recognize some of them. I'll chime in when I and I have one favorite that I'm going to talk about in detail. Okay. But yeah, so I can I can take us through the GameCube from oh, start yeah. to finish. So we are this now in 2002. Wheelhouse. Yeah, love GameCube was the first um, gen- console of this generation that I got. I did get it a couple of years after the generation started, um, but it was the first one that I got. So uh, we're now in 2002. Remember, Sega is multi-platform at this point, but we haven't... We've seen a few Sega games on other platforms like Super Monkey Ball, but this is the first time we'd see a Sonic game, like a mainline Sonic game on a non-Sega platform. It's a Sonic Adventure 2 battle. Sonic Adventure 2 did come out on the Dreamcast, so this wasn't an entirely new game, but the battle like multiplayer mode was new to uh, to, to the GameCube, or they added some new features, and it did have a like because it was different. It did have the only four GameCube like kind of thing going on in the corner. You know how how consoles do that when a system when it's a platform exclusive. So oh, yeah, yeah, Sonic Adventure Two uh, strangely came out before Sonic Adventure. We'll get to that. That comes out later. Uh, Sonic Adventure DX also comes out on the GameCube, but I guess because Sonic Adventure 2 was still pretty new and like still like this was a new game to a lot of people, I guess, because it came out in 2001 on the Dreamcast. So it was it was a fresh game still. Um, But yeah, uh, that was like the first time Sonic was on a console that was not a Sega console and was kind of a big deal. Oh, Um, yeah. Yep. Next game on the list. Finally. Took a little while, wasn't able to make the launch, but Super Mario Sunshine, the mainline Super Mario game, came out on the GameCube in 2002, and it picked up right where Super Mario 64 left off um, in terms of gameplay. Like, it's the same, like, cool, like, really clean, crisp platforming stuff, um, except you have a backpack this time that shoots water. It stores water and shoots it out. And so the the, the storyline of the game is... Mario is on vacation or something, and they land on Isle Delfino, which is shaped like a dolphin. Oh, yeah. I love this game, by the way. It's got a good message. Clean up the pollution. Yeah. So Peach gets stolen by, uh, like, Nega Mario or something like that, who has, like, a painter's brush. And he's been just wreaking havoc all over the island, making it all dirty and messy. And so Mario gets his backpack called the Flood, the... Oh, man, I wish I could remember what the acronym stands for, but I can't. Oh, don't even worry. I'll look it up for you. Don't worry Yeah, about it's it. F-L-U-D-D. It has two Ds uh, for a double dose of water, I guess. I don't know. Um, but the idea is that he's got to clean up the whole island while jumping and platforming and getting what are called shine sprites, which are this game's version of stars from Super Mario 64, and there's the, 120 of them. Okay, the flood stands for the Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dousing Device. Okay. There you go, everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have guessed that. I wouldn't have either. Yeah, but uh, it was cool because it, it like shoots water, and you could use it kind of as a hover pack if you you it's like a jet pack, and it could like ski around the I- island on it. It was really cool, um, and there's a lot of great levels for it. My favorite part of Super Mario Sunshine is the levels where um, you walk, you go into like a cave or something, and the Nega Mario. I can't. Does he have a name? The the bad guy. I don't. I think turns out to be Bowser later, but here, let me look it up. I'm sure I'm gonna look up his name real quick. But he steals your water backpack. Oh, it's just Shadow Mario. Shadow Mario. Okay, so Shadow Mario steals your steals your backpack, and you have to do these like just straight up platforming things 
um, with moving platforms and like you just got to get from start to finish. It's like it's really like old Mario um, games like where you had to get to the end of the level, but in like 3D platforming, um, something that uh, resembled it's sort of like an expansion on the Bowser levels from Super Mario 64. So there were three Bowser levels that were like that. They were get to the end and they had all kinds of cool platforming challenges on the way. Um, that's different from the other levels, which are more open world. Like there's no beginning and end. You just kind of go around the world and try to get all of the things in it. Um, so those are my favorite part because I really like the pure platforming. Um, on the Wii U, Nintendo would release a game called Super Mario 3D World, which I'm hoping will get a Switch remake someday because that's oh, my favorite Mario I've game. Heard that game is so good. Because it's basically an entire game of just this, of like get go from start to finish. Um, 3D Land on 3DS is the same kind of thing too, and that's really worth playing as well. Um, but yeah. 3D that, Land? I love those parts of Super Mario Sunshine, and so that's why I couldn't really get into Super Mario Odyssey because I just wanted more 3D World, and so I'm really hoping it gets a switch remake it's a switch remake that'd be awesome i like that they're doing that that they're remaking you know like the let's go thing is just hopefully the beginning of their remakes i really yeah, hope so <laughs> and they they remade um like donkey kong tropical freeze uh new super mario brothers u deluxe is a is a remake of a wii u game so and like uh captain toad treasure tracker all of these games that were really awesome on the wii u but didn't really get an audience because wii u ain't got no games even though it did have games but it didn't sell yeah. very well we really, just didn't do uh, very well. I really hope they remake Star Fox 64. They did I, for 3DS. They did for 3DS? Yep. Yep. Well, I'm hoping they do it for Switch, but now I have to pick that up for 3DS because, yeah. gosh, I love that game so much. Yeah. I'm just happy these Wii U games that were really good but didn't really have an audience because they were Wii U games are finally getting a little bit of an audience. Anyway, we digress. Next game on the list, 2002 still, we're looking at Animal Crossing, um, which is a really weird but fun game where you are an animal i guess or a human with horns and you get dropped off into a new town and it's full of animals and they're all very friendly and um as soon as you show up tom nook shows up and he's like hey you want this house i'll give you a loan for it and he runs the store in town and so you spend the rest of this game paying back Tom Nook because every time you pay him back, he upgrades your house and then says, you owe me money for this. And so um, you go around doing good deeds for all your animal friends and like making cool designs and fishing. And like, it's just like, there's no real start or finish to it. It's just the town is always cool because it's randomly generated and the game sort of plays while you're not playing it too. Like when you log back in and you haven't been on in a week, the like the people in your town will be like worried that you were gone for a week nobody saw you you didn't say anything oh no and there'll be like weeds growing in the town and stuff it was like one of the f first games that really felt like it was going on while you weren't there and it was completely it, single player it seems very stardew valley-esque like yeah. is what stardew valley was inspired by is that true yep. yeah people very love similar. stardew valley yeah stardew people valley is like that. uh it's like animal crossing and harvest moon mixed together uh and it, it I haven't played a whole lot of it, but it, I understand people. Yeah, love I've it, never so. played the Animal Crossing. Games. By the way, for some reason, Star Fox 64 3D for 3DS, ninety dollars on Amazon. Yeah, I think they stopped printing it. So oh. I think you could buy it on the eShop though. So it's probably sixty dollars on the eShop. But oh, I would rather do that then. Okay, good yeah. to know. Because I was gonna say it looks just like Star Fox does. Yeah, basically. except they re-recorded all of the voiceover lines. They re-recorded it. Yeah. Oh man, do a barrel roll. I hope that sounds so crisp. Okay. Yeah. What and the next game is Mario Party, which we all love. I mean, Mario Party. It's great games. Mm-hmm. They're having yeah. a Switch one come out of that too, right? A new Switch yeah, Mario Super Party. Super Mario Party. I have it. I haven't played it yet though. But Oh uh, man. Those are the funnest games to play with friends. Yeah. Those are so fun. I never really played Mario Party four, but it is the first Mario Party on the GameCube. So there are three on the sixty four. It oh, excuse me. And uh, there were three, four on the GameCube. I want to say they went all the way to seven on GameCube. Oh, yeah. The last one I played was for the first Wii Mario Party. Mm -hmm. And they had a game on it called Shake the Soda. And you just made a really inappropriate hand motion the entire <laughs> With the time. the Wiimote. Yeah. And you're just like, what? Do they know what they're making us do they right had now? To. <laughs> they, they had, had to. They had to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so man. funny. But Mario Party's, I love the board game atmosphere of it. It's like yeah. playing a board game on your TV. It's perfect. 
Yep. Yeah, and you you just go you, you try to get as many stars as you can. The person with the most stars at the end of the game wins, and they're always handing out like a bunch of BS stars at the end for like you got the most coins in the game. You stepped on the most blue squares in the game and, you, and like and just like you were the third things. player and then just give you yeah. stars <laughs> yeah yeah so whoever's winning when the game when the turns are over is almost certainly not the person who's going to end up actually winning the game after all of these like random bs stars get handed out oh um, yeah but it's still fun and the, the point is not to win the point is to have fun with your buddies so yeah play games for fun everybody yeah okay next game on the list uh speaking of star fox star fox adventures um, Ooh, I, which is, I, I remember when this game came out, it was kind of a big deal because people thought it was going to be like Star Fox 64 and then they thought yeah. it wasn't at all. Yeah. Well, so there's, there's a, it has a co- kind of an interesting development story that I'm not going to do ju- justice to here, but I'm sure you can find it if you look online. That actually might be a good, uh, good episode to do is uh, just the development process of this. So, um, uh, back in the N64 days, Nintendo announced this game. Um, that they were kind of promoting and they thought it was going to be really cool called Dinosaur Planet. And so um, it was like, oh, yeah, you'd be on this planet, it'd be full of dinosaurs, it'd be super fun. And Nintendo would kind of tease it a lot in Nintendo Power. I remember reading about this Dinosaur Planet game. Everybody was really excited for Dinosaur Planet. And then um, it was it's made by Rare, uh, who so made Donkey Kong and uh, Killer Instinct and all those games. And so you knew it was going to be pretty good. But... It never, it like kept sort of getting delayed and kept getting delayed and delayed. And then it sort of went away and it turned into this game called Star Fox Adventures. Um, and I think in some regions it's actually called Star Fox Adventures Dinosaur Planet. But um, yeah, so it ended up turning into this game where it's basically, it's like Zelda, but you play as Fox McCloud and you could land on the dinosaur planet and you have to save the dinosaurs from, I don't know, something's happening. Then maybe a meteor's coming. I don't know. But um, oh, wow. there is like an R-Wing flying section, like a couple of them, I think, that are similar to like Star Fox 64. Uh, but that's not the whole game. The whole game is this really this like Zelda style game. Um, that's a game oh, that I'd wow. like to play through at some point because I've played a bits and pieces of it here and there, uh, but I've never like sat down and really gave it. Uh, like what it deserves, so I, I should get that play through. An interesting thing I looked at the Wikipedia page and found. Yeah, Rare uh, after they announced like they were going to change the game to Star Fox, released a downloadable limited full length MP3s from the unreleased game, like of sounds and I think oh. voice acting and wow, that's pretty cool. That's cool. Like, oh hey, look at this stuff. I mean, it's going to go away, but here it is. So, <laughs> wow, that's cool. Yeah, I remember this game. Doesn't Fox have like a staff? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. fights as like staff. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I'm mm-hmm. into it. Yeah, it's right. a it's a neato neato game. I think um, so Sonic Mega what, Collection. What? Yeah, I don't know anything about. Is this like just a collection of all the old Sonic games? Is yeah. that really what it is? Oh, yep. Wow. That's really it. It's just like Sonic One, Two, Three. Um, it had a bunch of Master System slash um, Game Gear games too. Um, that's pretty much it. It didn't have Sonic Adventure or anything like that, but it was neat. Um, I, being a Nintendo kid growing up, hadn't had a whole lot of Sega or it's like Sonic Sega exposure, um, just like playing at friends' houses and stuff like that. So when I got Sonic Mega Collection, that was when I was like, oh, yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm into this. And I played a lot of Sonic games. Um, it's pretty cool. I think and you, could, next... you could play the oh, Knuckles versions of, of 2 and, and 3 and stuff like that, too. So Oh, wow. Now, yeah. the next game on this list is in all caps. and There's an expletive in between. So I think you want to talk about this one. Yeah. So next okay. game on the list, we're still in 2002, just so so you know where where we're at. 2002 was a good year. Um, Metroid Prime is my favorite GameCube game, and depending on what day of the week you ask me, this game could end up in my number one game of all time slot. Really I love Metroid Prime. It oh wow! Is, yeah, Metroid Prime is so. When Ocarina of Time came out, and everybody was like, man, they really took the Zelda formula and they made it in 3D, and it was just awesome, right? Ocarina of Time was great for that reason. Metroid Prime is great for the same reason, in that it took um, the gameplay of the Metroid games, the side-scrolling, like, only this wasn't a side-scroller, but, like, it took that, like, uh, like backtracking and getting new gear and, like, powering up to, to fight the boss at the end over time kind of thing, like the Metroidvania formula. It took that, and instead of making it a 2D side-scroller, it made it a first-person shooter. Oh, wow. 
That's so, a really big move, I feel like, for them, yeah. too. Because you don't hear and about first-person shooters at all, really, on the Nintendo platforms. Yeah, and it was... it was. Uh, I remember people being very, very skeptical of it because it was like, you're going to take this game that's 2D and you're going to make it a 3D shooter and you're going to try to tell us that this is like the same kind of game that de- deserves to be in this like pantheon of awesome Super Metroid games. And Nintendo was like, yeah, we are. And Retro Studios is going to do it. And so they made Metroid Prime and... It is so the graphics still look good today. They're gorgeous. Like they're just really, really cool. There's some really cool like rain effects where if you look up while it's raining, um, and, like you see the rain on Samus's visor. You can see her reflection when there's like explosions and like fire around her. Like you can see her reflection in her mask. And um you basically do what you do in other Metroid games is you do a lot of backtracking, you do a lot of boss beating and getting powers and powering up so that you can uh, learn more about this uh, mystery race called the Chozo that seem to have died off, but maybe haven't died off on this um, this planet called Talon 4. And there's like a, the, the first area you start out in is like a jungly area, like wet and rainy jungle area. There's a, there's a uh, ice area. There's a, uh, uh, Magmore Caverns is like a underground lava and there's like a, a, a phase on mining. Oh, it's so good. The game's so good. The graphics are great. The music is some of the best in all of gaming history. Like this is like, if you want some good study music, put on Metroid Prime soundtrack because it is like, you got the Talon Overworld theme. You got Magmore Caverns is great. Um, the Fendrana Drifts, the the uh, ice area is so, like, this music is so good. Like, oh, man, it's, it's great. And it plays awesome because it's a first-person shooter, but it has some Zelda elements of, like, um, L targeting. So when you press L, you, like, lock onto a thing. So it's, it's less of a Twitch shooter and more of a, like, first-person adventure game. That's what Nintendo was calling it at the time when they were like, so you're making a shoot-em-up game, huh? And Nintendo was like, no, 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 it's a first-person adventure game. And so That's that, awesome. And yeah. you can still do the moves where you like get in a ball and roll around, right? Yep. And all that stuff. Yeah, That's you get in so a ball, cool. roll around, you got the grappling hook, you got missiles, super missiles, you got all your good stuff. Um, all of the classic uh, Metroid power-ups are there, and it is just phenomenal. And I highly recommend you play it if you haven't. It's not super long. It's I mean, it's as long as a Metroid game, so it's like 10 or 15 hours, but it's really, That's really great. Still, That's awesome. Big fan. Could talk about it forever, but should probably move on. The next game on the list is... Uh, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast. The reason I put this on here is just because I want to keep some continuity. Remember, we talked about this on the Xbox. It also came out on the GameCube, and it was a PC port, which is uh, neat because the GameCube didn't get a lot of those PC ports like the Xbox did. Uh, But it did get Jedi Knight 2. It didn't get uh, Jedi Academy, Jedi Knight 3. Um, So I guess the third one in the series? I didn't put that together. Yeah, so I guess they gave up on the Jedi Knight series on GameCube. It was cool. It didn't go online like the, uh, I don't think maybe the Xbox one didn't. No, I don't think it did. Um, but it had, it didn't even have like system link the way the Xbox one did. So it was like, eh, four player split screen. You can play the campaign. It was okay. It was, it was fine. But I want to talk about it cause we talked about it in the Xbox one. So it was also on. Oh GameCube. yeah. That's uh, great. next still 2002. We are still in 2002. Yeah. In 2002, 2002 had so many games come out for the system. Yeah. So in 2002, um, we got we also got a real uh, uh, Zelda game as well in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, which was very, very cool. It was like this cartoony style, which was very different from what we had come off of on the N64. We had these realistic um, Ocarina of Time and then Majora's Mask. They were both like, I mean, they were stylized because everything on the N64 had to be stylized, but um, they were definitely more grounded in reality in terms of their their graphics. Um and and tone too especially majora's mask that game was super dark um so yeah majora's mask was like really tonally dark right yeah because the whole world ends in three days (laughs) yeah the the whole the whole game is dealing with grief and loss and like death and stuff it's super dark it's it was rated e for everyone which is crazy to me but um but anyway wind waker came out and it was like super cartoony cell shaded it was not what people were looking for i remember when they announced the art style um people were like what I don't want to play this cartoon crap. You got, you got GameCube with all these awesome graphics and you're going to put cartoons on it. What? Um, and it wasn't helped by the fact that when Nintendo was showing off the GameCube at like space world 2000, they were like, look how awesome our graphics are. And they're like, here's a fight between, uh, Link and Ganon. And it was like super realistic and like definitely looked like a continuation of the, the N64. So that's like what people were sort of expecting when, uh, 
when they announced Wind Waker, and then they were like, oh, it's this cartoony thing. But um, if you play the game, it is great. It's totally deserving of the Zelda mantle. Um, the main gimmick in that game is um, the world of Hyrule has flooded, and so um, most of the world is covered in water, and so you have to... Uh, you have to take a boat everywhere. And so it has this really good sailing music while you're sailing from one island to the other and the boat talks to you and it's, it's really good. But yeah, you do your, your, your dungeons. Um, it's very standard Zelda in that sense. Um, but it was very I want a fun. talking boat. Yeah. It was a talking boat. That's really cool. I wish all boats talked. Yeah. So I hope they remake the, the Wii U version of that game too. Cause they, they made like a, a, like a, not just a port, but like a remade version for the Wii U. And, uh, I, would love to see that on the switch as well yeah when we get to the wii u i'm kind of excited to talk about it because it's been kind of a neglected system right Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm a i'm a hardcore wii u advocate so i would love to talk about that system um but back to wind waker when wind waker was up for pre-orders one of the like pre-order bonuses you could get was uh and you got it i'm pretty sure you got it early too so you got it before wind waker came out was this disc that is Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time plus Ocarina of Time Master Quest. So the Ocarina of Time uh, uh, portion of that disc was just, it's straight up Ocarina of Time on the GameCube. It was slightly modified to so the controls matched up, like they changed some of the coloring of, of that kind of stuff. And um, they changed the Crescent and Star logo on some of the things to be a less uh, like religious symbol. Um, so it had some slight modifications in that sense. Um, and... Uh, there's one other thing I feel like they changed, but I can't remember. Anyway, oh, uh, they upgraded like the the resolution, so it was just looks a little smoother, runs a little bit smoother. But the real cool thing about that was the Master Quest portion, which is the same thing. It's Zelda Ocarina of Time, except all of the dungeons are remixed, so they're completely Whoa. different than what you remember playing through, uh, and they're harder. Um, so if you were had like played through Ocarina of Time a million times and wanted an extra challenge play the master quest did you ever um, play the master quest version i did yep did yeah you it's it? great i did yeah of course you did because you're the best at video games I'm, i know i played a lot of ocarina of time so master quest was was a really really fun uh like way to play it again but like with an additional challenge um the disc is pretty rare now because it was just a pre-order bonus for wind waker but you can still find it you can get it for about 30 or 40 bucks so um it's not Ooh. cheap but it's not it's not easy to find either you got to kind of seek it out um, the next game on the list is the one you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Take it away. And this is, I mentioned it last week, but without saying the name, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. This game was actually published by Nintendo, but it was developed by Silicon Knights. And I think it's interesting because you wouldn't think Nintendo would dev- like publish a horror game. But this yeah. is straight horror. Like you walk as multiple characters through different scary areas and you slowly lose your sanity. And the big thing about this game was they would have this system called sanity effects, which I learned Nintendo actually patented really that thing. Yeah. But huh. it's strange because I don't know if they've used it in any other game, but no, I don't your think so. Player would slowly lose their sanity as things would happen to you in game. And then weird stuff would happen in the game. And out of game so the examples i found from wikipedia are like minor things would be like skewed camera angles or heads of statues would start to follow you or you'd hear weird noises or the walls and ceilings would start to bleed uh or you'd enter a room scary that is unrealistic before finding that the character never left the other room you were just in whoa yeah so you'd like be in a room and then you turn around and it's the same room you were in before and you're like wait what (laughs) The character sudden, oh, these are now major effects, but the character suddenly dying out of nowhere. He would just die. Uh, The fourth wall would be broken with an effect such as to be continued or uh, promotions for a sequel would pop up too, I guess. That's crazy. The best thing they did, and this is the out of game, is they would simulate errors and anomalies of your TV or your GameCube. So your TV would just turn off or your GameCube would like restart or it would look like it shut down. And it was to the point that people thought they would actually have problems with their GameCube and like, oh, no, that's part of the game. Like they're trying to creep you out. <laughs> and so like, I remember oh, no, actually, erasing my memory card. Yeah, I remember being with my friend in Alaska and we, I was watching him play this game. And it was really scary because it was when you'd have like 
family sleepovers and you'd all be in his, and he had a TV and a GameCube in his room. So we just never slept. And <laughs> my brother and I were watching him play this game and then his GameCube just shut off. And we were like, wait, what? <laughs> it was really scary. Wow. It's a really cool game. Like, yeah, I like this mechanic and I don't know if they've ever used sanity effects in any other game because they had sequels, I think. To Eternal Darkness? I don't think so. Oh, wait, it was a canceled sequel. There it is. Yeah, they were going to do, uh, he said absolutely yes in 2006, and then it never came out. So that's well, a bummer. Still waiting. Yeah. So, hey, you know, it was a really cool game, and it was just, I think, really a different release for Nintendo. Because, you know, the whole Nintendo, we've talked about it before, but like all about family friendly gaming. And yep. then in this game, there's blood seeping out of the walls. So yep. <laughs> just the way it is. But yeah, that ends 2002. And now we go into 2003. With a game that I think is up there with you, Tyler, because you mentioned uh, this before. Yeah, so we talked about this a second ago when we were talking about Sonic Adventure 2. Well, in so- in 2003, Sonic Adventure, the first one, would get a sort of uh, remastering. Like, it wasn't a full-on like remake of the game, but it was like a, some extra content. But Sonic Adventure DX came out on the GameCube and served as a way for uh, people to catch up on Sonic Adventure 2, things like that. Um, it, it was great. It was a port of Sonic Adventure. So if you liked it on Dreamcast, you'll like it on GameCube. If you didn't like it on Dreamcast, you're not going to like it on GameCube. It's basically the same game. I think it had some extra stuff in there. I think they had, they included some like Game Gear games and like some like achievements and things to unlock and stuff like that. that that's pretty fun. But, um, yeah, mostly it was just a way of, of like getting another Sonic game out to people who didn't play Sonic like, games because they everyone had Nintendo Everyone needs to consoles. play Sonic. Play yeah. Sonic now. Play yeah. Sonic now. Next game on the list, F-Zero GX, which is the sequel to F-Zero X, which is the sequel to F-Zero, which came out on the Super Nintendo. F-Zero X was on the Nintendo 64. And then on the GameCube was F-Zero GX. And there, it, it, the, the, the F-Zero series of games, I think we talked about on the Super Nintendo. Um, F-Zero is like you're in like these cool hover cars and you're going like hundreds of miles an hour. It's a racing game. Um, it's where Captain Falcon came from. If you are a, you are a Smash Brothers fan, Captain yeah, Falcon Falcon's is from, punch. Yep. Captain Falcon is from the F-Zero series. Um, what's interesting about F-Zero GX in my mind is around the same time, there was also an F-Zero arcade game that came out, which was F-Zero, but for arcades, it was more very similar to GX, but like more ar- like just set up differently because it was in an arcade. Um, you could get, uh, like if you had an action replay or a Game Shark for GameCube, there was a code you could put in that would just turn the game into the arcade game. Um, oh, wow. They were, it was like the whole arcade game was in F-Zero GX, uh, which is kind of interesting and cool to me, so... That is really cool. I never played any of the F-Zero games at all, which is why I only know him, Captain Falcon, from Smash. Smash. Yeah, that's what I first saw him. I'm like, who's this guy? I don't know. He's pretty cool, though. His punch thing's good. (laughs) Yeah. I mostly played uh, F-Zero Advance for the Game Boy Advance. I forgot there was also a Game Boy Advance version. It was more or less just F-Zero Super Nintendo game, but for Game Boy Advance. Um Next is SSX3, which we talked about in the Xbox list. Um, it's my favorite SSX game. I just got to talk about it because it was also on GameCube. Super fun. Uh, ski down the whole mountain. Very fun. Snowboarding, Snowboarding. down the whole mountain. Awesome. Yeah. Skiing wasn't in until the next SSX game on tour. Oh, that's cool. They decided to add skiing, though. I like that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about a game that was sort of special to me and my brother um, called Quidditch World Cup that uh, is a Harry Potter game where you basically, like, are on a Quidditch team. It's basically Madden, but for Quidditch and, uh, it's super fun. And like, it was like one of the few ways to actually sort of live out the fantasy of playing Quidditch. Um, cause you can't really play Quidditch in real life, at least not to the extent to like they do in, in the books or the movies. So, um, yeah, Quidditch World Cup was very, very fun. Um, I don't think it was particularly a, a great game, but, um, it was fun for me and my brother to play and we had a great time. Yeah, according to like Metacritic and sites like that, it got about a 70% all around. So it was yeah. probably like, it was an average game. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't really yeah. shown as like being amazing. So yeah. I do yeah. like the idea of making a sports game style out of a fantasy thing. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I think it was just like, hey, if you wanted to play in Quidditch, this is a way to do that. And it's playable, I guess. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's a playable it a- game. Yep. Um, Mario Party 5 also came out in 2003. That's my personal favorite Mario Party. I played a lot of it on the GameCube. Um, it's more of the same, though, of Mario Party 4. It's just just 
mini games and board games and having a great time. So uh, awesome. I don't need to touch on it too much. I do remember it was at this point. It probably did this before. Um, but remember in the first Mario Party where they had all those games where you had to like rotate the joystick and people got blisters on their palms and like had a bad time. Oh yeah, yeah. Though, I know that by Mario Party Five, there were maybe they maybe did this way earlier, but by Mario Party Five, those games had all been replaced. Like that mechanic was basically replaced with just mash A as fast as possible. I just remember doing that a lot in this game, is mashing A as fast as possible and never doing the the joystick thing. So, um, oh, interesting. Yeah, um, I know you got some experience with this next one on the list. Ooh, it's probably my favorite Mario Kart. It's Mario Kart Double Dash. Oh, yeah. This game is so fun, and it was a cool variation of the whole Mario Kart thing in general, and then they kind of abandoned it. What did they do differently? Well, you had two riders on a cart, and they each had their own separate driving stats, I think, didn't they? I think think so, yeah. Yeah, and then one of them would be the item thrower, and one of them would be driving, and you could swap them. You could switch them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was so fun. And I think you could even play where one person was the thrower guy and one per- like one friend was oh, the thrower yeah, guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, my, yep, one no, friend my was brother and I played guy. like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just a really fun... It made two players, so you could play a technically like single player Grand Prix two player, which mm-hmm. I think is really cool. And in a personal note, Tyler and I were in a theater department in college and they brought the GameCube and Double Dash into the green room and then the professors made us take it away because it was so good and distracting and they were like, no one's doing work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing Double Dash. Because it's uh, an the, amazing The rider game. in the back could like punch people too, like on the side, like racers like coming up oh, on the side yeah. and like punch people. And, and you remember, could, it kind of oh, helped you with turning too. Oh yeah, because they like would some like momentum. move to the side and stuff like that and help yeah. you turn faster. Also, Waluigi's in it too, which I thought was really oh. cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. As, it had a huge cast of characters. There were a yeah. lot because obviously it's like the double the amount so you could pair right. them up. It also, I think, was the first time they had, and I could be wrong about this, but different kinds of carts. Because I think so, yeah. They're like two or three different kinds of carts for each yeah, driver. In, six, in 64, it was just the basic carts, and this was the first time they let you choose different kinds of carts, which I thought was just a fun addition because you're like, yeah, customize everything. It's so much more fun. Yeah, su- super, super great. Uh, I super always played as game. Toadette, which I think Toadette? was the first game she was in. Toadette, yeah. I think I played as Big or King Boo. Oh, that's a good choice. I th- or one of the one. I don't know if it was King Boo or Boo. I know King Boo's in the newer Mario Kart games, but I played as a ghost for sure. Or mm-hmm. the blooper guy. The blooper guy was in it. I remember. The oh squid. yeah, that yeah. was fun. So the next game, I don't know what's the Zelda Collector's oh. Edition. What is well, that? This is where. At this point, this is where I got my GameCube because the Zelda Collector's Edition disc um, is a disc that was included. There was a couple different ways to get it. I think if you signed up for a year subscription of Nintendo Power, they would send you one. Um, if you like uh, redeemed all your rewards um, for buying video games, I don't know. Nintendo always has some weird point system going on. You could get it from their website um, or it came packed in with GameCubes at this point in time. The Zelda Collector's Edition disc had four Zelda games on it. Zelda 1 for the NES, Zelda 2 for the NES, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask. It did not have Master Quest, but oh, it did wow. have Ocarina That's of still Time. a lot of games. Yeah, and Majora's Mask, and it had like a 20-minute playable demo of Wind Waker. Um, curiously, it did not have A Link to the Past, and I think the reasoning for that was because A Link to the Past had just been released on Game Boy Advance, and they were probably trying to yeah, not take like, away sales. Yeah, these Game Boy Advances. Yeah. Right. That's right. Um, but this is why my brother and I eventually got a GameCube, was because we saw this, we saw this game packed in, and we were like, we know this will be good, and then we'll be set when we want to pick up some GameCube games. So this was at towards the end of 2003, I want to say. Um, but I played... I happily played Ocarina of Time again on GameCube, like for the, probably the tenth time at this point. Um, so so good. Uh, it ran smoothly. It was the same version that was on the Master Quest disc, uh, but they didn't include the Master Quest. Um, and then Majora's Mask uh, was was cool. This was not the first time, or this was like not when I would play Majora's Mask. I remember we rented it when it first came out. Didn't really like it. Still didn't really play it on the Collector's Edition disc. Um, but I played the NES Zelda. I played Zelda Two. Um, it was cool. And it had this like neat movie that would play like a Zelda sort of 20 year retrospective. I think it was, tw- yeah, 20 years at this point. So I had like a retrospective thing going on, um, for Wind oh, Waker. Oh, cool. Yeah. I it will was say, fun. I also did not really get Majora's Mask when it came out. I rented it when you would rent games mm-hmm. and I was so confused and I didn't know what yep. to do. And I just like 
finally figured out that you could change time at a certain point in the game. So you had to get to the point where you could change time and then you're set. Then you have an yeah. unlimited amount of time to beat the game, essentially, because right. you just keep resetting it. But I didn't really understand that. So Yeah, it took me forever to figure that out, too, because it was like, wait, why am I starting over? I lose all my room. What? What? What is happening? Um, yeah. But you get all that kinds pretty of quick, fraud. right? Once yeah. you get that, you get it pretty quick. I think you have to beat the first dungeon before you get that stuff. Maybe not. Uh-huh. I don't remember. I should replay it. I should maybe get the DS version of it. Yeah. I'm thinking about playing classic versions of games now on my Nintendo DS because they have so many out for it. I was just looking because there's Luigi's Mansion, the Star Fox. There's also a bunch of Zeldas. Like, yeah, I mm-hmm. can go back. Yeah, it's awesome. You can play Snake Eater too, Metal Gear Solid Ooh, 3. Ooh, really? Mm-hmm. Ooh. On DS, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that game's great. Anyway, back to GameCube. Last game that I want to talk about for 2003 is 1080 Avalanche. Um, if you played 1080 Snowboarding on N64, did you play 1080 Snowboarding? 1080. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I love the game's Panda. game's great. 1080 Avalanche is more of that. Uh, I didn't play too much of this game. I picked it up like years later when I saw it at like a Goodwill or something, and I played a little bit of it. But man, I loved 1080 on N64, and I was really excited for 1080 Avalanche, but I just never got it. And as a kid, you have to be choosy of what games you can get, and uh, I never chose that one. So That is the problem. You must be choosy. It is yep. true. All right. Now we're on to 2004, and I will make a mention before Tyler starts explaining his next amazing game that he loves, because I already know why he loves it, and you'll know soon, too. Uh, these are getting shorter and shorter as we go along, because I like to think the development cycle is kind of ending, right? Yeah. <laughs> so 2004 well, is when it starts to kind of start going down. Yeah, it starts to slow down. There's still a lot of games that come out at this point, but like there, there's a lot of like just like not uh, non-mentionable, like just like third not, party baloney would you say yeah That's how not I notable it. i guess i should say uh there's i mean i'm sure there's plenty of like gems in there that i don't really know about um but uh but yeah it starts to slow down at this point i think it just, at, by 2004 it starts to become clear that like hey nintendo's not quite the platform to do this stuff on if you want to reach a lot of people you put it on the ps2 if you need a lot of power you put it on the xbox the gamecube is like this is where nintendo releases their games and it's sort of the same problem they had with the n64 and to a certain extent to the the super nintendo um where they just didn't have ain't got no games just no third-party games it just becomes the system that nintendo releases their game on um yeah which we still briefly... makes it worth owning but mm-hmm. we, there's a we, lot fewer games we briefly mentioned it on when it happened in history but the whole third party publishing thing i think completely changed video games a hundred percent and nintendo was very late to de- like adopt that you know yeah and <laughs> they when they did they, ha- the they had like a stranglehold on it they still like they just never really recovered from that yeah um but anyway we're in 2004 talk about this first game it's your yeah, favorite this first sure. game uh is is great it was actually published by nintendo on the on the uh, GameCube, Metal Gear Solid, The Twin Snakes, which is my favorite version of Metal Gear Solid. It's a remake of the original Metal Gear Solid with a lot of the gameplay elements from Metal Gear Solid 2. Uh, it was had good graphics, had like kind of a first person mode, which makes one of the fights like super, super easy because it's just the <laughs> fight was not designed for first person controls. Um, but yeah, it's a it was a great like sort of a uh, cool teaming up of Nintendo and Konami um, and also Silicon Knights, the people that made uh, Eternal Darkness. They made Ooh. Twin Snakes. Um, and it basically was just the first Metal Gear Solid game, but but improved with the gameplay improvements from Metal Gear Solid 2. There's a few um, like Nintendo references in there, like in Otacon's lab. There's like a, a GameCube on the desk and a Mario and Yoshi like statue on his desk. And um, when Psycho Mantis reads your mind, I say this with air quotes, reads your mind, um, like on the on the PlayStation version, he would say the names of some uh, Konami games. He'd be like, "Oh, I see you like playing Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, and stuff like that." On the GameCube, he does the same thing, but he talks about some other Nintendo games. I think like he talks about like Super Mario Sunshine and, and stuff like that. Um, and I think Eternal Darkness might be in there too because that's a Silicon Knights game. Um, so they changed a couple of stuff to to have some some Nintendo flair, um, but it's mostly the same game. It's the best version. All of the cutscenes are redone in like a sort of matrixy, like with a lot of like flips and slow mo, and it's like not quite as realistic as the original on PlayStation. So some people don't like it as much. I think it's awesome. Um, next cool. on the list, Pokemon Coliseum, which was a uh, sort of an extension of the Pokemon Stadium games that came out on. Uh, 
Nintendo 64, we had Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Stadium 2. They added like gold and silver support for gold and silver Pokemon. Pokemon Coliseum would add support for Ruby and Sapphire Pokemon for the Game Boy Advance. Um, and it was uh, basically you transfer your Pokemon to your GameCube and you battle them out in awesome graphics on your TV. I fun. didn't I didn't realize this and I'm looking at the game. It had a single player mode. Yeah. Where you're in the ore region and there's no wild Pokemon because it's a desert. So you snag Pokemon from trainers you fight. And then I was like, wait, are you Team Rocket? What's happening? You seem like you're stealing Pokemon. It's really weird. I don't know. I I didn't play it that much, so I don't know about the storyline. I do know there was another Pokemon game released around this time called uh, Gale of Darkness, Pokemon XD. And I think it was kind of an expanding on that single player. It says in this, uh, it's a Wikipedia article, but it says that they added wild Pokemon to that game because they, people thought this one was weird. But the interesting thing is the whole ore region is molded and inspired by Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for wow. Phoenix. They don't really get a lot, you know? They just, no, but they got this I, one. Got that one. <laughs> Pokemon Coliseum. Um, Zelda Four Swords Adventures is the next one, which was a cool top-down 2D, like classic sort of Zelda in the same art style as um, the Minish Cap on Game Boy Advance, and also which is similar to the art style from Wind Waker. Um, but it was a multiplayer Zelda game, so there's like four links on the screen, and you run around doing stuff and causing trouble for each other, but also cooperating to solve puzzles and defeat what I'm sure turns out to be Ganon in the end. Um, it's neat because it's like a... a a multiplayer Zelda game on console. Um, That's really it, cool. It, it had some Game Boy connectivity too. I don't think you had to have Game Boys to play it, um, but I think it, it did, like you could sort of manage your, your own inventory and stuff if you had a Game Boy hooked up. Which yeah, is I neat. think this idea of the top-down like Zelda um, making it multiplayer is a really good one that I think they could do a lot more, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, next on the list is Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, a sequel to the N64's just Paper Mario, which itself is kind of a spiritual sequel to Super Mario RPG. Um, it has a lot yeah. of the same kind of gameplay systems of being like a turn-based RPG. Um, but the art style is this really cool like paper cutout style where everything, everybody is like flat, 2D made of paper, um, which is like... If, very interesting to me. Kind of reminds me of uh, what they did for like Yoshi's Island or uh, Yoshi's, yeah, Yoshi's story, Island. Right? Yo- well, Yoshi's Story also, but Yoshi's Island on the Super Nintendo, like this sort of, sort of stylized, oh, um, yeah. like storybook kind of feel almost. But it was like a proper JRPG with like turn based battle system and everything. Um, I haven't really played it that much, but I would love to. And that's one that I'm kind of thinking about maybe firing up one of these days. I will say. Best thing about having your game be developed with that art style is it never looks bad because that's the way it's supposed to look. You know what I mean? Like yeah. when people go for super realistic graphics and you're like, Ugh, that didn't age well. Like Paper yeah. Mario doesn't really have that problem. Yep. Uh, so that's cool. Oh, you know, we should go back. Well, we could, we just talked about it at the end. We haven't talked about Smash Bros. Oh, geez. It's not even on which is here. A, which is, it wasn't a launch title. I think it came out. Oh, I know. It's not even, I didn't even, wow. I just totally skipped over it. Um, oh, man. Smash Bros. We, came out. We talked about a whole episode without Smash Bros. Melee on. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. We what kind of busters would we, would we would be? Goofed. All right. Let's take it back to 2001 here. About a week after the GameCube came out, Super Smash Bros. Melee came out, which was a sequel to Super Smash Bros. on the Nintendo 64, and it was a sweet freaking fighting game where you pick your favorite Nintendo characters and you just wail on each other, and it was fun for hours and hours and hours. Um, we've talked about Smash before on the podcast, so we don't need to go into too, deta- too much detail, but Melee is notable because it's the one that, like, people latched onto as this like competitive game. Um, Smash Bros. Brawl would come out in 2008 and wouldn't quite capture people the same way. Smash Bros. 4 came out on Wii U, would, did a little better than Brawl, but like it's still, when you're talking about Smash Bros. these days, especially eSports Smash Bros., you're talking about Melee still. Um, yeah. Mar- it introduced um, Marth and Roy from Fire Emblem. I know that. Yep. And my friend and I were trying to like decide who the better one is. And the answer is Marth because he's taller and has more reach. But it's like... They're, it's really cool what they've done. And they also added, didn't they add, well, they added a bunch of new stages, but what didn't yeah. they add some other, they added some cool things like, uh, there was um, an adventure mode, which was kind of cool. Yeah. That's the thing I'm thinking of. The adventure mode is like yeah. a whole new thing, which is good because I feel like, especially with fighting games, you can kind of get bored of them really quick. But if you add cool stuff like this, it really changes the game. Yeah, I agree. 
So Why anyway, did we go and forget that. Man. I know. I yeah. So whew, we rerounded 2001. Make sure we don't forget that. Um, taking it back to 2004, the last game we want to talk about here is Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, which is the sequel to Metroid Prime. I did not love it as much as the original Metroid Prime. Ooh, uh, it's serious just, words. Uh, I never finished it because it has this weird mechanic where until like a certain point in the game, you have to be, there's like a light world and a dark world. And when you're in the dark world, you're constantly taking damage uh, as you move like between like little bubbles of safety, which I just didn't find super fun. There is a point where I think you get a suit that makes it so you don't have to do that anymore. Um, but it also had like ammo on this, the other guns, which felt weird. And it just, I should go back to it and give it like a fair shot. But I remember being really, really turned off by some of the mechanics in it and being like, this is a Metroid prime. And then just turning it off and never playing it again. Yeah. And just kind of a bummer, but, uh, there's only, anyway, the, so it, they, they did the whole trilogy, right? The Metroid prime three came out, but that was, was that, that for was on the Wii? Wii? Yeah. yeah Metroid yeah. prime three was on the Wii, which I also take issue with, but we can talk about that when we get to the Wii. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the last one I want to talk about. Two thousand four. We've only got two games in two thousand five that I think are like super notable to talk about. I'm sure there's something we're missing because we freaking glossed over Smash Bros. So who knows what we're missing here? But in two thousand five, uh, we got Star Fox Assault, which Ooh. is a true Star Fox game, not Star Fox Adventures, which nice. was still very fun. But Star Fox Assault was a proper um, like shoot 'em up Panzer Dragoon, like proper sequel to Super Mario or to star fox 64 uh it's pretty fun i never played through the whole thing but it's more or less the same kind of stuff better graphics runs really smooth it's like 60 frames a second i think it's like it is very very good um super fun to play i the next game i want to talk about is donkey kong jungle beat which was kind of a this like, is the sort of, music game right yeah it had bongos and it was kind of a ddr sort of or like if you've ever played taiko drum master for like the ps2 it was like sort of like that i just think it's cool because it came with a bongo controller that um had like two bongos you could hit but it also had a sensor in the middle that could sense when you were clapping over the top of the bongos so you would like be hitting left and right and clapping and like it's cool it's like you played different songs from nintendo games and stuff um but it was like this was sort of the beginning of um, the rise of like plastic instrument music games. Um, yeah, with like Little, Guitar uh, Hero, rock, rock, rock band, Guitar Hero. Yeah. So anyway, it was it was cool. It was it was fun. What a crazy um, fad. <laughs> yeah, we. I would love to do a whole episode on that. At some we point should. Too. We definitely should do that when we get to like our more. I guess I could say, uh, person like strict this is a specific topic we're talking about, you know, when we're yeah. done with the timeline, cause man, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now we're on to 2006, um, which only has a couple of games. Also, the first one I want to talk about is a game called Odama, which is a super weird game made by the same person who made Seaman. So of course that, it's weird then if that helps you out at all, it's a, it's a gameplay wise. It's a pinball game, but the, well, it's a pinball game with some other stuff going on. So basically you're like in control of an army and you use this giant weapon called an Odama, which is a giant ball that rolls over things and destroys what you're trying to destroy. And you control it by using flippers like a pinball game. Um, but the cool thing about this game was in true, like same as like Seaman, it had a microphone, it came with this microphone where you could order your troops around to like order them out of the way of the ball and stuff like that. So you could like tell your groups to move different ways. Um, I don't know how well that feature worked, but it's kind of cool. And the game was just interesting to look at. I just remember it coming in this giant box and being like, what is this game? Because it came with a microphone. Um, and it was like this really weird pinball game. So I don't know. I thought it was worth talking about. You know about. what? You got to give, his name is Yuta. Well, it's Yutaka Ute Saito. So Ute's his nickname. Mm. He's been trying stuff out, you know? Yeah. He just got, really tries new weird stuff. So Got to respect that. Got to respect it. Wait. There was a Seaman 2? Really? That came out for the PlayStation 2. How did we miss that? Huh. Oh, weird. Well, maybe we'll talk about that when we go do like our top weird games list or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. Um, also released in 2006. Uh, actually, it was released on the GameCube and the Wii. Yeah, I this, feel like we shouldn't spend too much time on it because I imagine we want to talk about it with the Wii because it was yeah. pretty important for the Wii. It was. 
I do think the GameCube version is the better version, but Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess um, came out. It came out on the Wii, and then like two or three weeks later, it came out on the GameCube. Um, it was yeah. originally made as a GameCube game, and then Nintendo realized, uh, crap, what are we going to have for launch titles for on the Wii? We ain't, we don't got nothing. Wii's going to have no games. Let's put Twilight Princess on the Wii. But they already still had this GameCube version rolling around, so they might as well put it out on GameCube as well um, without all the motion controls and stuff. Um, Twilight Princess is great. We'll talk about it when we get to the Wii because, like you said, it's uh, much more influential for the Wii, and we're kind of running out of time here as well. Um, but it was great. I think it was better on the, the GameCube. Interesting thing about it is because um, Link is normally left-handed when he fights with his sword. Um, but on the Wii, because of the way you hold the controller and because of the way the motion controls work, they wanted to make Link right-handed because it would match up more with how you would use a controller. Makes total sense. Rather than just switch his hand, uh, switch the sword in his hand, they flipped the entire game. So the whole game is mirrored. <laughs> so if, you're, if you've played it on Wii, you should still play it on GameCube because it's a completely different feeling game when it's just entirely flipped around and vice versa. Um, the Wii U version actually gives you the choice if you want to play like the GameCube version or the Wii version, like the flip version. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, it's just an interesting kind of fun fact about it, but we can talk about it more when we get to the Wii. Now we're on to 2007. And the only game, because this is well into the life of uh, two years into the Xbox 360, we're a year into the Wii and PlayStation 3, so we're hitting the end here. The last game released on the Nintendo GameCube was Madden 2008. It's always Madden games. Yep. Because they make them forever. Yeah, they just just just, really love. The last couple of years of a Madden game on a console are really, they just phone it in and update the rosters and like shove it out the door. Is really oh, kind of what they sure. do. This game hasn't changed since Madden 2006. There's on one the thing GameCube. you want to learn from this whole like timeline thing. It's if you're looking for the last game on a system, it's probably a Madden game. Yeah, or a FIFA <laughs> game. Like on the PS2 FIFA. was FIFA 14. Yeah, damn, that's so yeah. that's so so later, <laughs> so much yeah. later. Yep. Cool. Well, that's, that's the it. timeline for the GameCube, right? We got yeah, it. Yeah, that's our timeline. I'm sure we missed stuff. You should tweet at us if we missed something. Uh, we can we, have, we can maybe talk about some other stuff too. If if yeah, I was we ma- say if, made some egregious errors like Smash Bros. Yeah, if there's ever a game that we don't mention on one of these lists, and you're like, how can they not mention that game? Yeah. Let us know, and then we'll talk about it on the next episode. You know? Yeah. Obviously, if you tweet us or email us in the week, obviously. But yeah, definitely would love to do that. Mm-hmm. So, Mike, just love talking about video games. What have you been playing? I have been playing a lot of Destiny with you specifically, mm-hmm. but I've also picked up Red Dead a little bit again. All and right, getting back into it. Getting back into it. I'm really close to beating it. I feel like I'm within like five hours of beating it at least. Mm-hmm. And I just really want to get there. And it's not, I don't feel exhausted with the game. I just want to like finally stop being worried about spoilers, but I kind of know they definitely foreshadow things that I can guess where it's going to go mm-hmm. at a certain point, but it's still really fun. And I really enjoy it. I don't think I'm going to be able to like, when I got the game, I was like, Oh man, I'm going to play this for like 600 hours. And now I'm like, I want to beat the game. So I have closure and then kind of <laughs> take a break from the whole thing. And then yeah. maybe pick up red dead online way later down the road. That's, That's my thinking. Idea. Yeah. Cause it's just, it's really fun though. And it's a really good game. And I see why they cut the story down from 65 hours to 60 because it's a, it can just drain you. You know, yeah. so it can be a slog. Yeah. I've also been playing a couple indie games that, I mean, I guess I could say on the podcast, I've been kind of working in indie games a little bit for the last couple months or whatever, mm-hmm. or I guess since September. And I've been play. I played one uh, strategy game that is not released yet. That's a pretty cool idea. It's called Precipice. Mm. And it's the a cold war strategy game but all the countries are represented by animals so america's like an eagle <laughs> in like a suit and a and ussr is a bear in a suit it's really cool it's a really cool looking game and then there's also a game called ascend that's in early access on steam that's a three like a multi-direction shooter like you're a spaceship and you're dueling other spaceships it's really cool it's a cool idea but there's way more to that but it's been really fun and i've been playing those games and enjoying them so i thought i would share it with the world nice uh what have you been playing 
I've been playing Destiny with you because we always play Destiny. Um, got some, we got some good drops today. Some we RNG got the shotgun. Big yep. news. RNG's EP favorite. shotgun. Yeah. EP shotgun. Yeah. How so many times nice. do you think we played that? Like five times in a row? I think Four we played eight. I think we played it eight times. Oh dang! I didn't even notice. It just went yeah. by. Yeah, so we fast. both got it though. It was worth, and it's fun. That's and it's fun. And it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just finished up this week, uh, Marvel Spider Man for the PS4. Um, Ooh, you've been on finally a big got Spider-Man back into kick. it. Yeah, I've been on a huge Spider Man kick. Um, I finished Spider Man PS4. It's oh, it's so good. The storyline is great. Gameplay's great. Swinging through the city so fun. Um, I do plan to play the DLC at some point, but I kind of got a little bit Spider Man out at least on the game. Um, by the time I finished it, I was kind of ready for it to be done because it's got it's a lengthy campaign too. It's not short, um, so it was fun. I uh, love it. Highly recommend it. I've also been reading a lot of Ultimate Spider Man comics, like basically from the start of Miles Morales's run of being Spider Man. I've been reading all of that and like through a couple of the different crossover events. And I Marvel Unlimited is such a good deal. It's like sixty dollars for a year, and they have it's like. They just have every comic, basically. It feels like every single Marvel comic that is older than six months is like yeah, in there. I really want to get that so it's, bad, but I want to make sure I have a device I can read it on that gives it justice. That's yeah. the big thing. iPads Gotta are get good. Like a, Kindles are good, too. Kindle Fire is really good. I've heard, right? yeah, you were saying the big Kindle Fire is the best yep. one, like one of the best ones to read on. So yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm interested. Yeah, so I've been doing a lot of that, and that's been a lot of fun. And then the way they do the crossover events is they'll have like they'll bring in the Avengers or X Men or something like that in a in a crossover event. And then by the time the event's over and you've been reading these other comics to sort of make sure you get the whole story, you're like, oh well, now I care about all these X Men, so I better read this X Men comic from now on. And I care about the Avengers now too, so like now I better read, keep reading. So I'm like, now I'm reading. Uh, well, they're called the Ultimates in the Ultimate Universe. So I'm reading the Ultimates comic. I'm reading Ultimate X Men, and I'm reading Ultimate Spider Man too. So, dude, you're just reading them all. You're just going yep. for it. I like. I want to read Spider Gwen next because she is one of my favorite parts of Into the Spider Verse, which is what kicked off my whole Spider Man mania. So Into the Spider Verse, loved it. Now yeah. I've just been uh, all Spider Man all the time. That's a really, really, really good, good movie, and everyone yeah. needs to go watch it. It's so good. Yep, that's about it. Like that, think that right. covers it. We're this, we're we're running pretty long here, so yeah, we are. Uh, I will mention, as always, that we're on Twitter at me Coletta at sneaker elf e l p h for Tyler. You can also email us at codexhistorypodcast at gmail dot com. You can rate and review and subscribe to the podcast, and that would make us feel magical and amazing and wonderful. And I'm looking right now to see if I need to shout out anything. So Tyler, if you want to say anything right now, you know this would be a great time to just say something like whatever's on your mind. You know? I was just going to let you keep going as long as, All right. as you wanted well, to. Well, I, I found out we don't need to shout anyone, but if you rate, review, and subscribe, we'll shout you out on the podcast, and I will read the full name, so don't put your first and last name on there unless you want to be known to the world. Uh, right. <laughs> that's just how I read things. And with that, I think that's it. That's it. Goodbye, Thank everybody. you all so much for listening. Goodbye. This has been a Potaholics Comedy Network presentation. Potaholics.com.